Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have been invited back to address this year's Global Legal Context here in Singapore. The last time I attended, we did so in person um, and I was heavily pregnant. So it's actually amazing how much things can change in a little over a year's time. For way of introduction, uh, my name is Lily Chen. I'm the Group General Counsel for Ampro Flexibles Asia Pacific, one of six operating business groups of global packaging manufacturer Amcor, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon's panel session. I'm joined here today by three esteemed speakers, Mr. Kiran Deep Singh, Ms. Amanda Williams, and Ms. Sarabi Madan. Kiran Deep is a senior partner in, litiga in the litigation and arbitration practice of Dentons, Roddick and Davidson. Kieran graduated from Oxford University in 1997. His primary areas of practice are construction and engineering, energy, arbitration, general civil and commercial litigation, and anti-bribery and corruption. Kieran was recently named in the Best Lawyers in Singapore 2021 edition for his, for his arbitration and mediation practice. He has also been named on numerous occasions as a recognised practitioner for construction in Chambers Pacific, Asia Pacific, and in the Euro Money Guide to the World's Leading Construction Lawyers. Amanda is the General Counsel for Baruch Proprietary Limited, a petrochemical company which supplies the automotive, energy and packaging industries. Amanda began her career in private practice, litigating in the US federal courts before she moved in house. She, re she relocated to China in 2009, after which she had an opportunity to collaborate with external counsel in managing litigation from in-house jurisdictions all across Asia, including China, the UAE, Singapore and Indonesia. Sarabi is the Director and Global Counsel for ASM, a Dutch semiconductor equipment manufacturing company. Sarabi was called to the bar in India, where she worked alongside senior counsel in high sex litigation and arbitrations. She is recognised in the Legal 500 GC power list for Southeast Asia and has more than decades experience as in-house counsel with, techno with technology companies, including GE, Xerox and in her current role. The topic we've been asked to address today is Alternative Dispute Resolution Asia Pacific with a spotlight on Singapore. Attached to that topic are a number of subtopics, which include current developments in the future of ADR in Singapore in 2020, the in-house council's role in ADR and litigation, what we think the role of ADR in the resolution of commercial disputes should be, should ADR be business's first port of call before commencing any formal proceedings, and then resolving technology disputes through alternative dispute resolution. Now, we don't propose to address these topics uh, one by one. What we will be doing is we'll, we'll be sharing some insights with you in relation to these particular areas, but coming from the perspective of our, of our own practices and experience, having worked across these various fields in both litigious and non-litigious matters. So, to start us off, we're going to hand over to Kiran Deep Singh to talk about and give a current overview of the developments in ADR in Singapore. Over to you, Kiran. Thank you, Lily. I have uh, some uh, slides to, to guide me in my presentation. Um, not that much time, so we'll go through this quickly, although there have been a number of developments in Singapore on the litigation and arbitration front, um, at the ADR front. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, we can, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Right, so I'm going to look at the latest developments in arbitration and mediation in Singapore over the past year or so. And the most significant development I'm sure many have heard of, it was reported quite widely in the media, is the Singapore Convention on Mediation. Now, to put it very simply, it is the equivalent of the New York Convention. The New York Convention, as we know, applies to arbitration awards around the world. And it's a, it's a convention where parties agree to recognize each other's, countries agree to recognize each other's arbitration awards. There are over 150 signatories to the New York Convention. So the Singapore Convention on Mediation is similar, but, or maybe you could say almost similar, but it applies to settlement agreements. Mm -hmm. So it is a convention where countries recognized settlement agreements or international settlement agreements on commercial disputes. So for example, if you have entered into a settlement agreement, if I'm, I'm based in Singapore and I have a contract with someone in the UK and we agree to settle that, and there is a settlement agreement that we enter into, and if the UK party or for example, the Singapore party does not 
uh, meet its obligations under the settlement agreement, that agreement can be enforced. Right? For example, I can take it to the UK. If UK is a signatory and has ratified the convention, then I could take it to the UK and get the UK courts to recognize that settlement agreement and allow me convert that into an order of, of the UK courts, the English mm. courts, and then allow me to enforce that settlement agreement in the United Kingdom. So this, um, as you see in the, in the final bullet point, it facilitates international trade and commerce by enabling parties to enforce and invoke settlement agreements across borders. Now, the convention only applies to commercial disputes, like I put in the slide before, it's only commercial disputes. It doesn't apply to a judgment or an arbitral award. You may have a judgment or an arbitral award on a settlement agreement. Uh, you may sue on a settlement agreement and get a judgment or an arbitral award. The convention does not apply to that. You have to use other regimes, for example, the New York Convention, of course, or any other reciprocal enforcement regimes you may have in respect of judgments. It doesn't apply to personal family or household purposes. Uh, it doesn't relate to inheritance or employment law. So like I mentioned in the beginning, it is to the purpose is to enforce the settlement agreement or to invoke the settlement agreement in order to prove, to prove that the matter has been resolved by settlement. So you may produce this before a particular court and say, look, this is a settlement agreement. This country uh, is a signatory to the convention. There has been an action commenced here, which should not have been commenced because we have agreed to settle this matter. Here's the settlement agreement. I want to invoke it under the convention and you have to dismiss this claim because we have agreed to resolve our differences via uh, this settlement agreement. So that's the purpose behind the convention. Now, just like under the New York Convention, there are grounds to refuse enforcing an arbitral award on very narrow grounds. The grounds for refusing to recognize or enforce a settlement agreement under the Singapore Convention is also similar. Uh, you may resist the enforcement of an international settlement agreement by arguing that one party was under an incapacity, mental incapacity, maybe a minor. Uh, you could argue that the agreement is not binding null and void for various reasons, inoperative or incapable of being performed under the law to which it is subjected to. For example, it may be a settlement for an illegal purpose. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, an extreme situation could be a settlement in terms of not paying someone a bribe and you agree to accept a lower sum. I mean, that's, that's a bit extreme, but it, it gives you an idea of, of what could be null and void or incapable of being performed under a law of a particular country. Um, you could argue there was a serious breach by the conciliator, the mediator of standards applicable to, to the conciliator. I mean, your breach of natural justice, maybe the mediator did not hear both sides. Maybe there was some form of coercion, coercion on the part of the mediator. Uh, or a very wide ground of uh, granting relief would be contrary to the public policy of one of the, uh, of the countries, of, of one of the contracting parties. So those are the grounds on which you can resist um, enforcement of a settlement agreement. Very similar to the New York Convention grounds. Now, the status is this 46 countries turned up in Singapore when this agreement, the convention was signed and included your largest economies in the world, US, China, your li largest economies in Asia, India, South Korea. Another 24 countries attended the signing to show their support. Other countries have signed up to the convention. But um, so far, the take-up rate or the ratification rate is not very high. Um, mm. It's expected. I think it will take a few years. So parties that have so countries that have so far uh, ratified the convention, accepted or approved the convention, or ceded to the convention are uh, Fiji, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and of course Singapore. Singapore passed the Singapore Convention on on Mediation Act in 2020. It was passed on uh, 4 February 2020 but it has yet to come into force. So um, hope to see many more countries ratifying this convention. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a, a Singapore citizen myself, have been so since birth. I'm very happy to see an international convention named after my country. Um, you have the New York Convention and now you have the 
Singapore Convention and hopefully for, for years and decades to come, it will be just like a New York Convention, the, uh, the, the hallmark you know, for, for enforcing settlement agreements, international settlement agreements around the world. Now, just very quickly, um, I, I mean, no, no webinar in, di in this day and time, would, uh, day and age would, would be complete without talking about COVID-19, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I think many are, are quite actually fed up of hearing COVID-19, but it's something we can't run away from. Now, because of COVID-19, there has been an acceleration in the arbitration arena in terms of uh, virtual hearings. And many arbitral institutes are pushing ahead with virtual hearings and have even come up with protocols and guidance notes for both parties and arbitrators when it comes to virtual hearings. Um, and these include a, a protocol from the ICC and also from the CIR, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. Now, why, why you may ask, why necessary? Why is it necessary for such protocols? Why don't, why don't we just get online and, and get on with it? Now, there are a number of considerations, which is why guidance notes and protocols are important. For example, a party may wish to have an in-person hearing, and it needs to be. It may need to be clear that you know um, to prevent any allegations of breach of natural justice. Uh, you know, it must be clear that the hearing ought to go on as soon as possible. If we wait for an in-person hearing, it will be too late. There would be excessive delay. Certain other considerations that come up is if parties don't agree to a virtual hearing, and if the tribunal then decides to hold the uh, hold it nonetheless, and tells the parties to turn up, could that affect the enforceability of an award? Could you say um, that that's a breach of public policy or a breach of natural justice? Of course, just like we had earlier on today, technical issues, you know, often crop up, you know, inadequate lighting, visibility, poor audio connection. These are all issues that will crop up. And how about confidentiality and privacy? You know, mm. uh, how do you protect yourself against hackers? Uh, how secure are these online um, hearings? You know, arbitration is confidential. It's meant to be confidential. Um, but if you have someone listening in, who well, is not a party to the arbitration. How do you control that? I mean, you can't see what's happening, for example, in the room I'm sitting now. I mean, I may have someone sitting on my right that you can't see by listening in on everything. So what do you do with, 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 uh, with issues like that? Um, how about different time zones? I must say that, that yesterday I had to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning. I had to get myself uh, to my client's office uh, at 4.30 a.m because we had to dial in to a telephonic conference with a, I shall not mention the, the, the state, but we had to dial into a telephonic conference with a court in the United States mm. at 5 a.m. Singapore time. Um, and uh, I mean, that was, it, it, and, that, and that call or that hearing lasted five and a half hours. So mm. I think it can give you an impression about practicality when it comes to different time zones. If you ask me, uh, I don't think it was very fair to us, but you know, uh, the vast difference in time zones and the need for the court to have the full day uh, in their time, you know, made it necessary for us to actually begin at that 5 a.m. in the morning. Now, um, other things very quickly, how, do, uh, it, it, can, how can it replace face-to-face -face hearings? There could be issues with documents. There could be issues with cross-examination exam of witnesses. In litigation and arbitration, visual cues, body language, I can tell you, is very important. And it's not the mm. same cross-examining someone over, um, over the webcam. Um, but reality is reality, and we can expect virtual hearings to be the norm in the next 6 to 12 months, um, given the travel restrictions, I, I believe many of us have not left our countries, yet alone our homes for a long time. And um, it, virtual hearings will definitely be on the rise, but it remains to be seen whether or not when things get back to normal, uh, business as usual, whether or not virtual hearings will replace physical hearings. I myself doubt it. I think this is a temporary measure, but it may, because it is, of course, far cheaper than traveling to a country paying for accommodation, paying for flights, and having a hearing, a physical hearing. Now, my final slide is just a um, just to tell you, it, it's not been done yet, but just to give you the heads up, 
that in July 2020, the SIEC, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, started uh, the process of reviewing the SIEC arbitration rules. The last revision to the rules was in 2016. And in 2016, they brought in, they introduced uh, various measures. They introduced various uh, cost saving mechanisms such as consolidation, multiple contracts and joinder of additional parties. Mm. Um, the expedited procedure and emergency arbitration procedures were also introduced. So what the SIAC is doing now is looking, re-looking at the rules. Probably there will be more, there'll be rules that will pertain to virtual hearings as well. But they're trying to beef up and make revisions to to similar provisions like they did in, in which they introduced in 2016. Multiple contracts consolidation, the expedited expedited procedure, the emergency arbitrator uh, procedure, um, rules pertaining to the appointment and challenges of uh, uh, arbitrators, uh, arbitrators uh, arbitral procedure, including early dismissal. Early dismissal meaning you can apply to strike out an arbitration on the basis that there's no merit to it and there's no um, meritorious claim. And finally, new technology and, and procedures that apply to the use of virtual technology when it comes to arbitral hearings. Uh, that's all I have. That is a brief overview of the latest developments over the year, last year or so in Singapore in the arena of arbitration and mediation. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. That's fantastic, Kieran. Look, thank you very much for those very insightful developments on the Singapore front. It's clear here, after having heard Kieran's overview, that this, there's certainly a role for uh, formal dispute resolution mechanisms, particularly in the arbitra arbitral field, certainly in Singapore. I think it's fair to say as well that the same holds true outside of Singapore. Indeed, certainly in these times, I've been involved in a number of different matters which span across the Asia Pacific region. Most recently, one in uh, two in Australia, one in India, one in Thailand. And you know, this move towards these virtual hearings certainly does pose some challenges in terms of how clients uh, present themselves and even from a strategic perspective. So these are all very important factors to consider when we're talking about at least the formal dispute resolution mechanisms, which we, we, we see more frequently. And certainly Singapore has been known to be a, a hot seat for arbitration of commercial disputes between parties because it is a fairly neutral, uh, neutral territory. It has a very robust set of rules, as Kieran has pointed out, and generally enforceable in, in most recognize, recognized in a lot of jurisdictions. So there's a lot of, uh, I guess, a lot of faith which people hold in arbitration in Singapore. Having said that, you know, there are other ways uh, by which companies and organisations look to uh, resolve their disputes uh, through more informal measures. And the question always arises in relation to whether or not there are, you know, whether or not there's other, uh, other means which people should consider first and whether or not uh, these more formal mechanisms should only come as a second port of call. So I guess to this point, we'd like, I'd like to ask a question to Sarabi. In relation to dispute resolution coming from an in-house context, should it be that uh, things such as arbitration should be business's first port of call, or should it be something less formal than that, such as you know a, a commercial discussion, top-to-top um, -top discussion? You know, how, I guess it'd be great if we can give some perspectives in relation to what you've seen as part of your practice. I know from my practice we. You know, it's very much based on strategy, but I'll let you address that topic. Over to you, Sarabi. Sure. So uh, what I wanted to answer this question from the prism of being a, a certified mediator here in Singapore. And I recall the training I went through uh, while being certified to be a mediator. And we were told not to be very loyally. Uh, <laughs> we, we were asked uh, not to, you know, sort of adjudicate on right and wrong and look at the law and the facts that the way you're trained as lawyer to approach any dispute, but to look at it from uh, the prism of someone who's trying to find common ground and who's mm -hmm. trying to uh, get to people to accommodate and, uh, you know, to get along peacefully. So that's that's very contrary to way, uh, like I say, we have approached disputes as, as lawyers all along. 
and and in my experience in um, uh, in in ASM recently has been regard to employment disputes. Uh, there is a tripartite alliance where you have uh, members from uh, the employee uh, trade union, the NTUC, the mem uh, members from uh, the Ministry of Manpower, the government, and also members from the Employers Federation. So everyone gets together. And if employees have disputes about, say, uh, salaries or unfair dismissals, they can approach uh, uh, this, uh, this tripartite alliance and engage in some kind of a, a mediation proceeding. Now, mm -hmm. although it is uh, it, it is clear that this is not something which is obligatory for companies to uh, to participate in, uh, but you know it's it, it comes with its uh, baggage of uh, not cooperating entirely with the MOM. If if you were to just at the outset say that I do not want to be a part of this mediation proceeding, mm -hmm. and and with that you know just uh, as a company. Uh, you know, trying to accommodate this venture of the, the ministry and of all, all three parties together and, and trying to participate. If you do uh, end up uh, in a mediation proceeding, then you're recalled of, of the same training that I went through as a mediator that, the, you know, at the very outset you're asked, so are you willing to consider some kind of an ex gratia payment or are you, mm -hmm. so it's, it, it jumps the gun, whereas a, 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 a normal dispute resolution process would, you know, ascertain the facts and see who's right and what are the grounds and what does the law say. If you were to terminate an employee, you'd say that look at the contract and if, if you provided them with notice, a salary in lieu of notice, you should have been good. And, and that's what the approach would have been. But with mediation, it's it's entirely different. It, 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 it goes on with the approach of this person worked for you for three and a half years. Look at the times. It's COVID-19. It's difficult to uh, to find a job in, in this current scenario. Are you as a company willing to accommodate and provide some kind of an ex gratia payment? So, so you see that's this entire approach is then different. So, so Absolutely. as far as ADR being the uh, you know first port of call, I, I think arbitration being clubbed with other uh, dispute resolution mechanisms is is slightly lopsided because to me arbitration is is more or less a formal uh, you know legal proceeding it's albeit not in court but uh, you know you have an award at the end of the day and it's it's just a little less fuss free it's uh, less fussy than going to a court and you know dressing up uh, and uh, addressing people as your your lordship and so it's it's, it's just different mm -hmm. in that sense uh, but with mediation and with negotiations and with other uh, branches of these alternate dispute resolutions which are typically clubbed with ADR the approach is altogether different so for for me it's uh, um, you know it, it's it, it's again it, I, I hate to uh, do this uh, this typical lawyer thing and say it depends on the facts and circumstances of the case but entirely the, it, it is what it is that it, it does in fact depend on the facts and circumstances whether we want to take this approach of being um, accommodating or do we want to say do we are we wary of not setting a bad precedent and we are very wary that if, if it's got to do with uh, uh, you know breach of confidentiality somebody stole our confidential information do mm -hmm. we want to go in for mediation or do we say do we want to hard stop there and say no we take these kind of things very seriously and we, we want to go the legal route so it, it does depend on the facts and circumstances. Absolutely. Very well said, Sarabi. I couldn't agree with you more that certainly uh, also depending on uh, on the appetite from the organisation perspective in relation to which path it wants to take. So as as the audience will be very, very well aware, the more formal processes can be quite time consuming and be quite, you know, can be quite costly. But if there is a very high stakes matter at hand, and that might be the way that your strategy uh, may wish you to play. On the other hand, if it's a matter which you know the organisation just wants to get on with business and put that one to, to bed, so it can continue to focus on its more you know its core objectives rather than being uh, distracted by a, a formal dispute, then matters such as you know matters may go to things such as mediation or alternative dispute resolution in different formats in order to try and attain uh, an outcome based on more soft factors, which you don't see as part of the litigation and a uh, more formal ADR process. So look, I think that's been a really nice uh, segue into the next question, which is really what in-house counsel role is in litigation and, and, and alternative dispute resolution. And for this particular topic, I'd like to turn to Amanda to speak from her perspective in relation to uh, 
what role she's played and what role she knows uh, other council play in this particular arena. Over to you, Amanda. Sure, thanks, Lily. Um, I think that the role of in-house counsel with respect to ADR or litigation, let's start with ADR. Um, at the beginning of a dispute or a problem, I think it comes down to the in-house counsel department to really decide on what the strategy is going to be. As you and Surabhi said previously, it really depends on the nature of the dispute, um, the appetite for acrimony and conflict among the parties, the possibility, perceived possibility of the parties of, of reaching an amicable um, resolution and also whether or not you choose to set a precedent or or um, set a hard line as a, as a company on, on a certain issue. So depending on any one of those many factors, that could lead you to believe that no, actually, we want this resolved quickly. We want to save cost. We would like to maintain as much confidentiality as we possibly can. This is an employee matter. This is in relation, as Sarabi said, to a breach of a confidentiality agreement. This is something that we really would like to resolve and move forward from. And in that respect, you know, uh, the general counsel can, can align on that strategy. The in-house counsel can align on that strategy, can address um, the issues of conflict with their internal clients, uh, the business counterparties, and hopefully put them in, in a good place to um, sit down together with their counterparties um, and resolve the dispute. I think that the first and best thing that an in-house counsel can do with, with respect to ADR and um, you know steps below litigation um, is even including a good ADR clause, nothing fancy, maybe even just the model clauses in most of your agreements. Because it's been my experience that when you do run into a potential conflict, people will notice that there's these steps that they must go through before they can file for arbitration or litigation. And it it tends to remind them that, okay, we might as well work it out now before we have to work it out later. And, and it kind of ends up um, short, shortcutting the, the conflict and, and sort of nipping it in the bud so that we're able to resolve that conflict and move forward um, successfully. So I, I really think that, that the first port of call really for an in-house counsel would be drafting really strong and appropriate um, clauses for alternative dispute resolution. And then, of course, uh, escalating up to arbitration. In, in my company, we absolutely include arbitration clauses in all of our contracts. Um, it's our preference to arbitrate under um, Singapore law in Singapore. Um, even when we have conflict or, that arises in, in our other uh, jurisdictions where we're operating. It's something that we prefer to, to use as our home base, as our home port. We're more familiar with the process here. Um, with respect to litigation, I think that the role of uh, in-house counsel is similarly strong. You have to be as familiar with the techniques and tactics so that you can align with your external counsel on the strategy there. Um, you also have to be able to take the um, information that you're receiving from external counsel and sort of re-filter it back into lay speak so that it's easily digestible by your internal clients, um, that they can appreciate and understand really what's at stake and what's happening in the litigation. And most importantly, that you know, you're know you able to say what maybe your external counsel is not able to say. For example, mm -hmm. we are definitely losing this case. We need to cut our losses yeah. now let's you know shut it down before it gets worse um that's something that your, your external counsel is just not going to be able to tell you um your house is on fire and we need to shut it down so i think that great communication between external counsel and in-house counsel is absolutely paramount so that in-house counsel can do their job for their internal clients yeah look i couldn't agree with you more amanda Certainly, in-house counsel role is is growing, you know, even more and more so to become a very strategic business partner in terms of ensuring that an organisation uh, has, has thought about any potential dispute and how to resolve that from all potential angles and what the ramifications of those decisions will be. So that's, you know, that's certainly something which I think is, has seen some evolution, certainly in the most recent period of time. So I guess now, turning back to Kieran, in your practice as a 
uh, uh, external legal counsel practitioner and then working obviously very closely with in-house legal counsel. Does what you've heard from both Sarabi and Amanda resonate with what you've seen um, as, as an external advisor to, you know, a number of different clients in various arenas? You know, uh, you know when do clients actually come to you uh, for assistance? Um, you know, is it at the early stage? Is it, you know, for ADR? Is it more when they're skewed towards litigation? Be great to hear some insights in relation to what you're seeing in practice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I echo what Surabi said. It, it depends on the facts, but mm. uh, most most clients, just to generalize a bit, most clients come to us. When, I mean, quite early on in the case, um, whether or not we encourage them to go for mediation, it depends because sometimes tactically it may not be the right thing to do. It may be the right thing to get your case out first, to show mm -hmm. the other party, look, you mean business, um, this is your case, it's a well-argued um, case. You know, you may want to, it could be in the form of a letter, you could serve a writ, you could commence an arbitration, you could serve them a report, depends on, on, on what the facts are. But um, I, from my, my experience, really, um, we, very seldom we go straight for mediation. Mm -hmm. It's mediation is always on the cards, but not necessarily something that you go into immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm dealing uh, with a number, a couple of cases at the moment, and uh, we 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 are only going to go to mediation once we have set out our case, once we have set out maybe uh, uh, what our position is, so that when you go to mediation, there is something to mediate, right? Mm -hmm. You know what the other side's position is, you know what your position is. You come there and you see, you know, look, um, this is the dispute and the mediator has a good grasp of all the facts. So mm -hmm. whether mediation is the first part of call depends on the facts, but very often, no. I think often it is some form of litigation. It, I, I wouldn't say actually commencing an action in the courts, but it could be making your case very clearly known to the other party. It could be commencing an action. It could be writing a, a long letter, setting out your position. It could be giving them a report, for example, if it pertains to construction, you may have an expert report that sets mm -hmm. out how good the case is. So mediation is always on the cards. Um, and for example, in Singapore, because of COVID-19, we have what we call the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. Mm -hmm. that gives uh, a degree of protection to players from the F&B industry, from the hospitality industry, um, tenants, as well as construction companies who are very badly affected. And there is an assessor procedure. I mean, if there's a dispute between the parties, you can go before an assessor. But what the Act says is before going before an assessor, you should negotiate. So the emphasis for mediation is, is very strong. And, and Singapore now has the Singapore International Mediation Center, mm -hmm. where you can commence an arbitration, right? You can commence an arbitration. Like I said, put your case, make your case known, and then move towards mediation. Mm -hmm. And if the mediation is successful, and a mediator, mediation would be before a different mediator, not the same arbitrator. And if the mediation is successful, you go, you go back to the arbitrator and you record the settlement. So um, I think mediation will come more and more to the fore. Mm -hmm. Now, as for Amanda's comments on the importance of in-house counsel, I can say in-house counsel very important uh, and I, I agree uh, spot on with with Amanda that in-house counsel's presence uh, I it, it is very important because you know the industry you know the company you know the business you know the characters of the individuals that we have to deal with that are giving us instruction so uh, in-house counsel I always prefer cases where they are in-house counsel present they understand the law and not only do they understand the law they are also very practical. They know they know the ins and outs of the companies. Uh, they know what to tell uh, the people. And in-house counsel also, I think, uh, uh, no disrespect, I, I mean this in a very good way. They also play a very good role in terms of being the principal. Uh, you tend to uh, push your your people in the right direction. For example, sometimes it's very difficult to get documents. Very difficult to get an answer from from a project manager or from a uh, um, a director and and that's when 
in-house counsel become very, very uh, useful, you know, because mm -hmm. they can say, hey, look, we need this. You better get it to them. You know, otherwise you're going to lose your case. And as Amanda mentioned, also very important in terms of mediation, because you could, you could, you could t t uh, tell the, 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 the board or the management, look, let's, let's, let's come to face with reality here. All right. Um, we are not angels. We, we, we didn't do the mm. right thing or, you know, we don't have such a strong case. So let us look seriously at our numbers. Let us look seriously at, at, at the need to settle this commercially. Uh, mm. So yes, um, mediation is going to come more and more to the fore. Whether or not it is uh, something that is the first part of call, from my experience, not always. It's it's good to put your case out first before going up to going to mediation. And I agree 100% that in-house counsel play a very important role in in both mediation and in litigation. That's great. That's a really nice insight, Kieran, in terms of your reflections on on the things that you've seen coming into your practice from in-house counsel. And certainly from an in-house counsel perspective, myself, I must say, look, you know working with external counsel was also part of the strategy you know it's knowing when to involve external counsel in relation to certain matters and when to know to you know give them the reins in order to you know to run certain matters but obviously make sure making sure that as as in-house counsel you're still managing and maintaining the actual uh, the actual progress of that matter so look you know it's a very it's a very strong relationship with in-house counsel uh, which they need to have with their external advisors and one that's you know obviously very highly regarded so look, we're going I mean, to... You raise a good Sorry. point. I mean, we need to be reined in, you know. External counsel needs to be reined in. And if, if, your, <laughs> if your people don't have external counsel, sometimes we tend to get carried away. So uh, <laughs> I agree, reining in is, 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 is there. You, know, you need to be there to rein us in. <laughs> no, I look at it certainly... We don't understand the business or we, you know, we are, we are so legally minded, you know, we, we, don't, we don't look at the practicalities. And that's when you come in and you say, look, Kirin, look, this, this is the commercial reality. Stop talking about the law, you know, this is what's happening <laughs> in the company. So, so reining in is, 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 is a very good, uh, very good way of putting it. That's true. Yeah, look, and I think it's, a, it's very much a symbiotic relationship because I think, you know, a, a, a good matter, usually those matters which have a, a good outcome, which are run both toe in toe with in-house counsel and external counsel are ones where the in-house and external counsel have a very close working relationship and they really understand when each has their role to play as part of that, uh, you know, part of that uh, ultimate, you know, dispute and the, and the resol resolution towards that dispute. So that's that's a very uh, it's a very important uh, role. So look, we're going to I change. Mean, uh, the... Sorry, sorry, just just, have... just one. Oh, go ahead, Karen. It's a bit of a, it's a good it's a, a bit of a good cop bad cop thing. Certain things your management yes. can hear from us, they don't want to hear from yes. you. I see. So, Absolutely <laughs> so right. Absolutely right. Them. In the barrel of the bad news, you know, objective. So you're right in, in working together. That's 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 so true. No, that's absolutely right. And sometimes we need the uh, we need the the clout which an external firm may bring to actually certain advices when sometimes the own the in-house team and the corporation itself may be a bit stubborn in terms of understanding what the ramifications of things might be. And that's when we might turn to yourselves to actually put forward the position and say this is reality. You know, it's really helps support the in-house counsel's perspective. Yes. So look, we're going to change gears now and turn back to Sarabi. Now, Sarabi, as I mentioned earlier on, has quite a rich experience as an in-house counsel with a number of technology companies uh, prior to joining ASM. So she's very well placed to speak to this particular topic, which you've been asked to speak about as part of this panel discussion, which is actually resolving technology disputes through ADR. So Sarabi, I know that you wanted to share with the audience some of your perspectives in relation to the resolution of technology disputes based on your experience and practice to date. Sure. Um, I have a few slides that I'd like to share. Thank you. So I, I think uh, technology disputes uh, from the perspective of an in-house counsel could be broadly classified uh, into two buckets. One mm -hmm. is where, as technology companies, we are sellers. Uh, like, uh, for instance, currently I'm with ASM. Uh, we are in the business of um, developing and selling semiconductor uh, capital equipment. And, and this is where we sell uh, technology. And then the other bucket is, is where we are buyers, like uh, is the case with, uh, with, with the majority of companies, where you're either outsourcing an information technology function uh, overseas or it's a cloud agreement it could be accessing portals or apps or 
ERP systems that, that we buy, it could be software or hardware. So uh, these are the two major buckets of, of what technology disputes would look like. And the strategies of resolving these disputes uh, is, is different in, in both these categories. So whereas in the first category where we are the sellers, uh, the kind of disputes we see is, is intellectual property related or, uh, or joint development. So there are instances where we are developing and evolving uh, technology uh, along with uh, some of our suppliers in some cases, also with our customers in some cases. Uh, because the kind of space that we operate in is um, uh, is so uh, it's so volatile, it's versatile, mm -hmm. and we we need to keep upgrading the technology. And there's new development happening, and then there's bound to be disputes around who owns that uh, development and who co uh, who cooperated and um, uh, whose whose contribution is greater. Uh, and and in, in case you do not have good agreements in place, then then it can lead to uh, disputes. And, and typically as an industry, what we've seen is that we go along the lines of what uh, Kiranjit was mentioning, that mediation or settlements and negotiations are in these cases not the first point uh, of mm -hmm. call, but they do happen gradually uh, during the settlement or during the dispute uh, resolution period. So you would typically start off with a very hard stand that this is this is my intellectual property and and I do not want to have a soft approach on let's uh, cooperate with each other and you know let's let's try and negotiate this dispute. You want it you want as a company to uh, put your facts out and say that uh, th this IP or, or this development belongs to me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you know having taken that stand and having gone to either court or whatever the agreement would provide for. Uh, you know, it has been seen that in majority of the cases of all technology disputes that you see globally, eventually companies do agree to uh, a settlement. It, it, ultimately, it comes to a figure and then, uh, you know, arriving at, I will buy this uh, technology from you, what, what do I owe you? And, and there's, there's the negotiation around that. So yes, I, I would agree with Kiranjit there that you don't, you don't make uh, negotiations and mediations your first port of call, but but you do make it your last so so as to is to get uh, uh, you know get a resolution and get moving on this because relationships are very important in these industries uh, for for us you you cannot have uh, you know numerous chip makers there are only a handful of chip makers in the world mm -hmm. and those are the people that you need to work with and sell to so relationships in this business uh, community are so important that it's not worth uh, a determination at the end of the day of who was right and who was wrong. It's more important yes. of how are we going to work towards this and how are we going to, you know, make sure that I can survive as a company. I don't lose all my IP and my right to this technology, but also I I am able to continue to do business in this industry. So 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 that's the kind of positioning we take as sellers. Now as buyers, it's it's very different again. So it's um, it's about uh, cloud agreements and. Uh, portals like I mentioned and sometimes we see that for apps and portals there are terms of use that are uh, you know you just need to click and you have accepted it and most of the time we haven't read through what those terms and conditions were and there is no mm -hmm. real uh, decision making or, or, or active decision making involved in what the dispute resolution mechanism should be in these cases and this this is where we are buyers and and sometimes uh, the companies that we are buying from are um, um, are monopolies in a, in a sense that you know you have mm -hmm. the Microsofts and the SAPs of the world, or or if I if I want to access Google, I, I and I don't agree with their terms of use. There's little less that I can do about it. So um so 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 there is there is that uh, you know the the bargaining position is is not good. But there are a few things that I wanted to highlight on what we then look at um, in terms of issues where formal legal proceedings are preferred. So if, if I feel that, uh, you know, th there's a cloud and we have all our global data uh, on a server and I, we want to now as a company agree to put it up on a cloud, uh, if, if we identify data privacy related issues uh, or if there is uh, issues like unauthorized network access. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a provider may have to access our network so as to be able to um, migrate the data from a server onto a cloud and then, then there is unauthorized access. They access or they, they mess up what was there and it's it's now, uh, you know, there, there's some kind of a bug or a virus or, a, or it's not in a readable format anymore. 
um, or um, you know, there's this breach of compliance of law that we, we've seen in some cases where we uh, engage with a service provider for electronically generating, say, invoices. And these invoices need to comply with the uh, tax regulations of different countries. And, mm -hmm. and if it's not in compliance, then that is not a point where we want to, uh, you, you know, uh, negotiate and mediate. We, we want to be able to make sure that we as a company position ourselves as, uh, as, as people who value data privacy of our employees, uh, of our customers, and, and all the data is secure. And if we do engage with, uh, with outside entities for processing of that data, we will absolutely make sure that, uh, you know, they have the requisite uh, securities needed, that the network is secure, that the, the uh, you know, uh, law is complied with in letter and spirit. So these are these are the kind of issues where we will uh, uh, typically insist on formal legal proceedings. But there mm -hmm. are other uh, uh, sort of issues where uh, ADR is more preferred. So there could be mm -hmm. issues, like I said, of uh, technological disruptions or where data migration has failed or installation issues, performance related issues, like uh, something is slow, it's not showing up, it's not working or uh, there, there isn't um, enough training material available. So these are the kind of issues that, that can be small but the impact can be very, very big. So if there is a tech disruption, it means your business it can absolutely come to a halt. And, and that is not a time where you want to spend in determining who's right and wrong and going to a court yes. of law. That is a time when you want to get this resolved in, in, in a, not a matter of days, but in a matter of hours. And, and therefore, you know, there, that is where you think that um, what you need to absolutely do is to be able to make sure that this is resolved very, very fast and uh, you know the, the disruption ceases to exist and this is where we prefer to have uh, mediations and or an escalation matrix that we, we would call it in technology agreements that if if a certain level uh, within an organization cannot resolve it we will have then tiers within uh, the organization and then outside of it who will help resolve it um, and, and also there's a certain amount of expertise that is uh, required for addressing these kind of issues uh, which is why for tech issues where we are essentially the buyer we sometimes uh, prefer adr more than uh, we would prefer formal uh, legal uh, proceedings um, and and finally i wanted to set out a few broad fundamentals of, of the advantages of adr in mm. terms of uh, technology uh, disputes and what we've seen is uh, the, one of the biggest uh, factors is is the language barrier so if I, 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 and we function in countries like China and uh, Taiwan and Korea and Japan, uh, essentially, and we find that, you know, if we were to initiate formal legal proceedings, we, we find that every document needs to be translated in, in the local language for the local courts, uh, whether, and this is not just about technology disputes, this is about any other kind of dispute. And, mm -hmm. and, and we find that, uh, uh, you know, to be um, a big factor for us to choose ADR over uh, formal legal proceedings in, in countries where uh, we, we face a language barrier. And, and then, like I was mentioning about uh, fast resolution for tech disputes, sometimes if, if that's what is required, we will prefer ADR. And mm -hmm. um, in, in other cases where there are several jurisdictions, we want one single forum, uh, as is the case with cloud computing. You, you have data from all over the globe. You would probably have, any company would have maybe one or two cloud centers uh, uh, typically in the us or in europe and and you want to be able to uh, identify where your uh, where your data where your asset resides and therefore have jurisdiction of that place and that this is also where uh, we would uh, we would prefer for a single forum and expertise uh, for these reasons we would uh, prefer adr um, in uh, in some kind of technology disputes i, I think this this is a broad uh, analysis and overview of what we as in-house counsel consider when we are thinking of resolving technology disputes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarabi. Look, that was really nice. And I think actually a lot of those principles that you've just spoken about actually hold true in relation to many other disputes. Again, it comes down to very much understanding your company, the organisational appetite and strategy. As you mentioned, there might be times when you actually don't have any, uh, any uh, alternative other than to come to some sort of uh, resolution fast because you may not have a, a large number of suppliers to actually perform you know the work needed for your business so this all comes down to good strategy which 
your in-house counsel plays a role in developing alongside your external counsel. So look, I think it's time to wrap up now. Um, obviously, it's clear that uh, both alternative dispute resolution mechanisms such as a mediation as well as more formal resolution dispute uh, dispute resolution mechanisms such as your uh, arbitration and litigation continue to play a role not only in Singapore but in also other jurisdictions as well and that they will continue to do so you know both in 2020 and beyond you know what you know I think the most important thing is always for us as both internal and external counsel to think about what our clients ultimate objectives are its appetite for any risk um, and what the reward is going to be of actually taking each of these courses of action. And obviously important that you sit down with the business and really understand you know, what the underlying is issue is when you are trying to seek to resolve a dispute so you can actually pick the most appropriate means forward. So look, you know, unless there's any further comments from the panelists, I guess it's, it's uh, you know, I'd like to close this session by saying thank you again to the audience. And I understand that there's some Q&A coming up uh, immediately after this session. So does anyone have any final remarks to, uh, any closing remarks from our panellists? Kiran, Sarabi or Amanda? Nothing further? Look forward to the to the questions and, and hope that this was insightful for the audience. Yes. Absolutely. 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 Look, thank you and thank you again uh, to Events for Sure for helping us, uh, to inviting, for inviting us to this session, also helping us to connect. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.